Blog Talk Radio. everyone doing a lafia and greetings to my old friends and I say Havarigani to my new friends. You are in the Oracle Divination Network. For short, you can say you're in the net. And this is the place to be today. We're going to be discussing the highlights of our conference that's coming up with Project 2019's annual conference. Some of you may have already received advertisements. This particular event is free, ladies and gentlemen. 
is a complimentary ticket up to five tickets. All you need to do is go out on Eventbrite under Project 2019's 2020 Annual Conference and collect your five tickets. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we had pondered over this thing to whether or not to charge, to charge, uh, to come back to $10 and then to say no. We're not going to charge our audience or our friends. We are going to pay it forward. And that's what we're doing today, ladies and gentlemen. We're inviting you to complimentary tickets to attend our conference. And boy, do we have a lineup for you this year. Normally, our conference is held at a banquet hall or at a hotel, along with a buffet-style meal. We had all that planned for you, ladies and gentlemen. Believe you me, right in Fisher, Indiana, they were going to host your banquet at the Baymont Hotel, one of the most glamorous five-star hotels in this area. We had it all locked down. The only problem was the numbering problem when we put in for our 25 people, they then told us we had to reduce that down to 10 people, and we said, no deal. We cannot afford to give a banquet that we have to pay up front for people that might not show up when they've had a restriction put on the curfew hour of the number of people that can gather. So we then changed that whole event around. You might have seen uh, me holding the tickets, showing the tickets off, inviting people to buy the tickets for $10. Well, that's no longer a goal. We don't want you to buy the tickets for any amount. I've lined up everything with Eventbrite, and Eventbrite has set up an actual page for us along with our itinerary that will be posted there telling you what the hours of the events are. We have a whole host of a lineup for you. Initially, you will hear my voice during the welcoming speech, welcoming everyone to the conference, okay, telling you what the itinerary is. I'll be outlining the first speaker, which will be none other than the, co none other than the founder and the CEO of Project 2019, Chuck Charles Sanford himself. Most of you know him as Chuck. We call him Chuck for short, but his real name is Charles Sanford. He is the founder of Project 2019. And who else could tell us the purpose of Project 2019, the goals and the objections and what strategies that we plan to put into effect to get this movement going? It is a movement, but of course, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a test. This is not a fundraiser. This is a movement. Now, Chuck has asked me to come back as the National Executive Director, which is the title I once held for three years before. Prior to that, Malika Ajawadi was an actual National Executive Director. She has since then made her transition. Bless her heart. We will be talking a little bit about her throughout the night or throughout the day. So you want to know the name, Malika Ajawadi, being one of our executive directors who brought Project 2019 forward. And what do I mean by that? She went out and she networked all over Milwaukee, all the way to Indiana, to talk to me about the project. And while I was there in Milwaukee, we were actually neighbors in the same building where I was working in the area of working with um, the, the Parent Information Center. She was working with Project 2019. She then began to tell me about the mission statement and the objection and what they were planning on doing with the people in this movement. I was riled up. And at that point, we began to network together, and I began to help her to solicit people to be in the movement. Now, Milwaukee, Wisconsin was on the ball. They was on fire for Project 2019. They had their before and after school program, tutoring program with her. They're writing up curriculum for the actual facilitators to carry out. They really, really got into the schools and made a difference. 
Now, when I came on board, I wanted every particular chapter to be consistent and look somewhat alike, especially if we were going to be applying for grants and funding to have these facilitators pay. I suggest that we get into those hard-to-reach areas, areas that we knew for a fact that needed help from parents. And because I have been working with parent groups and working with the Chad chapter organization, and I'd also started a black support group there in Schaumburg, Illinois, I came in ready to work and said, hey, let's do something consistent. Let's make sure that all of our facilitators are working on one accord in every location. Let's look at our parent information centers because they are evaporating. And some of them never were ever started in the black community. So I suggest that every chapter be connected to a parent information center. Now, where would they get the instructions? They could go to various different places to get assistance and help. And they can even apply for those 10 grants that they give out RFPPs once a year. And of course, we wanted to keep the before and after school project of working with tutoring. But we wanted to be an expert in this field. And since I have had some teaching background, I thought we would play the role of the clearinghouse where we would go out to the schools, take a look at their before and after school program, make recommendations to say if it's culturally relevant. Now, Hold for a second. Oh. Okay, how you doing, ma'am? Oh, I'm hoping to hear something from her tomorrow. I talked to her when she left me a message on Friday, but I was out of town. And um, she had received all the things from my husband, so I don't know if she was calling back to respond then. Uh, I was not in this area back to answer my home line. This is my home line. So um, uh, I got a call into her first thing on Monday morning uh, to see now that she's gotten all the information, you know, what was the decision because she told my husband that she had everything she was supposed to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully we may be able to give them some answer on Monday. Yeah. So I'll probably give you a call on Monday, probably on Monday afternoon. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for keeping me in the room. I appreciate it. I'll give you to the next. Okay, let's get back to this. I'm going to put on some music here for them. Ladies and gentlemen, and we're back. Thank you so much for joining me. I am your illustrious host, Omiinka Seven, here to serve you. I am your advocate. I'm here to serve you. I am your advisor. I'm here to give you suggestions. I am also your Maliwa. I'm your mother, too. So thank you so much for joining me today. You've been with me now for over 10 years. Some of you have followed me throughout the broadcast, and we've been on the air now for one decade. Isn't that great? We've been around for a while and we've had some excruciating situations because I was actually being featured on other platforms and had to be there live on Facebook, YouTube, Spreaker. But we still have remained true and faithful to this station. And we love the fact that we have a radio station where we can come to you 
from the radio station. And I want to give out those digits right now. For those of you who might want to call in, you can call in at 319-527-6060. Please do call in with your opinions because we are soliciting your opinion. We're talking about the highlights of the program for our movement. Project 2019. And just as I had been interrupted, I'm coming back to reiterate that Project 2019 um, has come a long way, 20 years to be exact. And as I was telling you about Malika Ajawadi and how I met her and how she introduced me to the program, and now we want to be the clearinghouse to make sure that before and after school programs are culturally relevant. Can you say that? Culturally relevant. Do they make sense? Are they designed to meet the needs of our culturally uh, relevant individuals who are from the minority section? Are we looking at assessing special populations correctly, and that is special ed. Are we looking at the majority of the populations being of people of color? And now we're looking at the Hispanics being identified for special ed, and most of them are going into English as the new language. They're going into sheltered programs. They're getting help with their culture. They're getting help with their uh, word uh, uh, frequency. They're getting help with enunciation, encoding, outcoding. They're getting all that help with their language because when it comes across, it comes across as a deficit, as a learning disability, either LD or BD. But most of those children get the privilege of being screened to become English as a first language or English as a new language and placed in sheltered classroom, protected and given all the help they can get, and then they're mainstream back into their classrooms. They don't get the label. They don't get the ticket. And there are different funding that covers them in a different category. Now, do the African Americans get this opportunity? No. And that's what we were concerned about. We have a brand new support system coming from NABI. NABI is an organization that works with bilingual students as well as pushing for lobbying laws and procedures and regulation that will give us legality. And one of the things that English as a New Language has that comes with it is a whole host of laws that they go to bat and lobby for. Black people don't even know these laws exist. If they did, they would be out marching for those laws for their children to make sure that their children get a first-hand screening for English as a new language rather than just placing them in special ed and putting a ticket and a label on them as learning disabled. Now, if they went into the English as the new language, they then would get the proper help they need on language and English and then get inserted back into the general population without a label. Now, isn't that grandmothers to know that your child doesn't have to get a label on them in order to get that extra help they need and to be sheltered, to learn about their culture and to learn about their linguistically appropriate background and history. And that's what I'm here to do. On this, in this conference, you're going to see me do a lot with Bringing on the speakers, number one, as the MC. Yes, I'll be bringing on the speakers, and then I'll be putting a hat on where I wear a role of actually speaking as well. Now, some of our lineup that we have coming up, as I told you, Charles will be doing the opening welcome, telling you about the purpose, why he created Project 2019. Then he'll be focusing in on his book that he has written about Project 2019's mission. Yes, we have a book that we can actually sell you, and I, don't quote me on this. I know it's going to be for a nominal fee. He will have those available where you can purchase those books and have your own recipe and order of service for 
this particular mission that we're on, how do you how do you set up your your household after this storm is over? We I also have the rainbow as one of our logos for our early childhood teachers, which I use overseas with the military teachers. This particular logo goes in your window to let someone know that you've been trained by Lilly Institute for Exceptional Education in child care, letting you know that that it might be stormy and rough, but after the storm comes the, the what? The rainbow. And that's what we have as our logo for all of our candidates who would like to go into the preparation for the indirect route non-traditional credentialing of the CDA Child Development Associate degree. That takes your life experiences and allows you to bring in six months between 480 clock hours of hands-on time teaching young children. We give you credit for that. You get a credit you get credit for your advanced standing of your life experiences then you must couple that with 120 clock hours, be it from a junior college, from a baccalaureate institution, or from a continuing education program. But we count those 120 clock hours that you submit with certificate and give you credit for them. And any deficiencies that you might have, we refer you on to complete the remaining portion of the 120 clock hours. That's what I've done for a living as an adjunct professor uh, that's what I have always did for the past, what, 30 years now. I've been involved with the CDA program. I am a CDA rep, and that CDA rep turned into a professional development specialist. Now I do all of it. I mentor, I assess, I evaluate, and I actually act as a mentor for the candidate who is applying for this credential. It's an indirect route to receiving your credentials, which will give you something equivalent to a two-year associate degree. It gives you nine credit hours for college that you can apply over into the two-year associate program uh, so that you can advance yourself and go on for a two-year associate in early childhood. I am so proud of that program because the council and myself, we have worked very hard to make ourselves available to those providers who have their own child care centers, we've urged them to go back to school and get your credential because Project 2019 prides themselves on closing the gap. And we know knowledge is power. That is our cliche also. So we encourage those mothers who have family child care centers or who are working at a family child care center who are not credentialed. We encourage them to go back to school. We even show them where the funds are to go back to school. We invite them out to our conferences online, whether it be in person or online. And we have even gone as far as to go overseas in Germany and introduce this concept to military wives who would like to have their own child care center in their home. So we go the distance. And we are specialists. We are scientists in the area of child development and family life. Now, my degree is focusing in on family life, not just the child, but the family as well. So I've gone a little bit further and gone into co-parenting resolutionists. We've even networked with a judge that comes in and that has been signing off on our co-parenting resolution training and allowing parents to get court order co-parenting training and have an advocate to work with them to help them through their online training. Now, that co-parent resolutionist can do other things, work with the father and help them understand best practices for working with school, working with school age children, preschoolers, and making sure that they are using appropriate activities with those children. Sometimes the parent needs to take these classes in order to get the children out of the system who might have been pulled out of their homes because of abusive behavior. And now the parent has to go to child development classes to show that she knows how to properly interact with children. Now, 
The other area of child development that we're talking about, the Parent Information Center, and that is for special population. We also want you to dub into that and to hear what we have to say about the Parent Information Center. This is one of the areas that they've developed grants in, 10 grants. And to my knowledge, they were once $100,000 grants, 10 of them. And you can answer the RFP, and if you got chosen to receive your grant, then you would get one of those 10 grants. Then you can set up your parent information center in your community or in your home, and you can specialize. You can make it for Hispanics. You can make it for Asians. You can make it for African American. They want you to specialize. And we're here to help you to get those parent information centers set up, push that we're pushing. And in source is the PTI for the state of Indiana. They are also offering a surrogate advocate training to get you trained and geared up to become a professional contracted advocate. And guess what? They're even offering incentives for monetary substance for taking the class. Yes, they even paid me when I took the class and I had to commit to making sure that I was advising other people about the training. Now, I went on and I got involved with the windmill and they had a grant activity going. So I applied and I won and I was able to take the fundings and do training and development for teachers and parents, which was a, a one week training program, which we've now packaged into a three-part training made by African Americans for African Americans on the laws of special education. And boy, did we address the special education laws and how we could reorder the special education laws for the African American male so that it could be a, 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 a applicable to helping the black male, not harming the black male. We've addressed a lot of things in that three-part packaging, and it will be for sale as well. And we're changing the packaging up just a little bit, tweeting a little bit, but it's been done and completed, and it is television ready. So we are all about the family. And because I was in the School of Home Economics and in the HERO program, Home Economics and Related Occupations, I was created for this because I knew home economic would give me a wealth of background in addition to teaching. So this information I can use to help communities, to help parents that are doing the work already of a servant, who are already advocating for their children, who know the laws like 94-142 IDEA, who know the articles of 11 through 13. These are laws that are very prominent in the educational field that can allow you to work as a contracted paralegal or as a contracted advocate. I worked as a contracted paralegal for the lawyers who were doing special education law. And that's why I learned so much and had the opportunity to get involved with arbitration as well as mediation and due process hearings. And this is what we do in order to help the schools from violating the parents and giving the parents the right to advocate for their children and providing the children with the best services, whether it be 504 or 94-142 or 457 Section 8. These are all laws that we're going to be getting into, and we want you to get on board and be a part of this. I've said a mouthful, so now let's go down this dusty road. Hold tight. Let's get a little bit BDP up in here. Let's see what we can do.
Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening to the sound of my voice. And for those out there who would like to talk to me personally, you can push those digits at 319-527-6060. Call in now, and we'll be happy to give you the phone lines and let you have at it. And throw your hat in the ring and put your two cents in. Yes, we're talking about revamping these school systems. Oh, you know, I had to quit school in order to get out of school in order to help the teachers in school. Now, this is a segment we're going to focus in on those principles. You know, everybody is always brushing up the teachers and mentoring the teachers, advocating for the teachers. But who goes in and advocates for the lonesome principal? Who actually goes in and creates a special circle of teachers to work with the principals because the principals always have to beg people to stay after school, soliciting for somebody to help them. And nobody's ever assigned to them. Well, I'm going to assign a crew to the teachers. And this is a special program that NABI, the organization called NABI, that works with bilingual education. They've actually created an actual package specifically for the school teachers And, well, not just the teachers, for the principal to delegate these orders by requiring that there is a roundtable circle before anybody decides on who goes to special ed, that there must be this MT meeting to assess this child. Now we have a different individual that we're requiring to be at that roundtable principal You don't just put your best buddies in there who are all going to smile and say the same thing you say. You want some objective conversation. We're going to be inviting a neutral person at that round table that will advocate as an surrogate parent for that child. Guess what? Most of the time you do staffing, you do empty meeting on the record. You staff on the record because the parents don't show up. You go on, push that thing through, and you make the decision for that child. And that is very biased because you have a biased opinion because you're working towards the school and not towards that child's best interest. So now we want to send in an surrogate advocate to sit at that table to make sure she represents that child and that child gets the best service and she speaks out on any indication where you are trying to throw that child in special ed, lock him down where he has no IEPs that he can address, and they're boilerplate. You just written them down and threw them into his folder. No, we want the surrogate advocate to look over that IEP and make sure it's in the best interest of that child. Now, mothers, you're going to have to get up off your asset and get to those MT meetings. And if you can't, you got to call in and ask for the surrogate advocate. And that's where we come in at. We provide that surrogate advocate, someone who's knowledgeable, who knows her laws, and can best advocate and demonstrate to the principal that she is on top of things. And if there is any discrepancy, where you have been staffing on the record, she want to call you out and let you know that is illegal. You cannot have the meeting just because the mother doesn't show up. You must send out for an surrogate advocate to sit at that round table to make the best decision that's in interest of that child. Now, this is something brand new. I know you haven't heard about it. And just because you haven't heard about it don't mean it don't exist. It should have been at the forefront of the principal's orientation at the beginning of the year. But the principals are not going out seeking this. This is more work for them. That's right. But every one of your teachers who are out of the classroom, you always request subs for them prior to the MT meeting. Yes, I know it's a lot of money you got to pay because you pay the sub and the teacher, but it is government requirement. Okay? Now, Government is now getting involved in making sure that you're not over-assessing the African-American males. And that's what's happening. 
you're over assessing them. You're just throwing them in special ed and assuming that they have the virus. So just put them in there and we'll figure it out later. No, you must properly assess them. If, they're, if they have a speech impediment, if they cannot enunciate, if they cannot read, then you know it's English as the second language. Because English is not their first language. Come on, work with me now. I'm going to take you somewhere. Why do I say that? Because English is not the African American's first language. What is their first language? Did you ask me that? What is? Well, I'll tell you. It's Ebonics. And it's you, your first language if you're an African American too. We spoke Ebonics before we spoke any regularized code before we spoke any orthodox orthodox english is still our second language and some of us adults still cannot pronunciate all of the orthodox english and we still are using ebonics but it's okay ebonics is a regularized code what did you say i said ebonics is a regularized code because it's used in the community on a regular basis. It is now being accepted as a regular language. So most of the children are getting by just speaking Ebonics. They're getting by trying to write Ebonics, but you're not having it. You want to know how come they're not speaking and writing Orthodox English. It's because you never taught them Orthodox English. They never got an English class. They never was taught how to use your, their vowels and how to uh, how to accentuate on those consonants. They never knew how to double those consonants in the word. None of this was taught. Was taught. What was taught was look and say. Rememberize this word. Look and say. You cannot learn through look and say. You have to have rules that follows the E before C, except after E. And you have to understand when you are adding various different consonants to words and fairy letters, the vowels. And when you are adding that extra E, when you're adding the D on it to make it plural or past tense. So you have a classroom full of children who are speaking Ebonics short sentences, and very few uh, uh, nouns, and they're using nouns all over the place. So they haven't been taught. So those children get thrown in special ed. They're punished because they speak Ebonics. They're put in special ed and say, we'll figure it out later. They can't read, so what? They're special ed. No, just because you can't read does not mean that you don't have the intelligence to read. You must be taught. And ladies and gentlemen, there are far too many teachers out there teaching who do not know how to teach English as a first language. They don't know how to teach reading. They don't understand the curriculum when they introduce the vowels and the consonants. They don't know that they must go back and work with those children who have failed to grasp the consonants and vowels and go back and reiterate in smaller groups, how to work with them. Those children are left along the wayside, and they cannot read even beyond sixth grade. They are reading choppy, and they have no comprehension skills, and you got teachers sitting back saying they can't read. First of all, you have to go to English as a new language and learn how to introduce. I said it, yes. You know why? Because I had to go back to school and pick up and a new, a double endorsement to learn all of those particular rules and regulation to help me to use it in the classroom for children who couldn't read. It was the best spent money that I could have spent. And most people that go back for English as a second language, they give them a forgiveness grant because they need teachers to know how to speak English and to teach English to children. Well, it should be a requirement. In the state of Illinois, when you teach early childhood, it is a requirement that they want you to get an endorsement in English as a second language because this is the foundation where you begin to teach 
the phonetic glance, phonemic awareness in the preschool, kindergarten setting. You don't wait till the child is third grade. Now you're going to be teaching him phonics. It's too late then. They've already developed uh, uh, procedures for enunciating, inserting, decoding. These, you teach them that in reading readiness, okay, when they're preschool and kindergarten. You can have them reading fluently when they're in kindergarten because they've learned the codes in preschool. And they now know how to enunciate and encode. They know how to take dictation at the board. They listen to the sounds and they write down the sounds that they hear. You don't teach them the alphabet. You say the sound, ba, ka, ba, wa. You tell them the sound and they begin to listen for sound. So we got children mismatched put in special ed, when in fact, it's a reading and a language disorder and not a learning disability. My God, look at all those kids in special ed who have been mismatched principal. That's right. And principal, guess what? You are the captain of the ship. And you know that every child must be properly assessed. And if you get Hispanic children in, and you know they have to go to shelter classroom, you only have a certain amount of time to get those children tests, to get them tests and assessed. Some of them never get tested. You just throw them in there. Wrong again. Because by law, every one of those Hispanic or special, uh, every one of those language in, in P children must be tested to determine what stage and what step they're at whether they need to be in shelter classrooms or in the mainstream classroom. You have a lot of work to do, principal. Yes, I must say so. When you start that school year out, you must go through all those students that are uh, dual language to find out which language do they speak, which language do they have an impediment on. Should those children go into the shelter classroom or should you put them in special ed? Don't just throw them in special ed because you haven't had time to assess them. You know, by law, you could lose all your funding for English as a second language in Title I. I'm here to help you. That's why we're giving this conference. We want to focus in on the before and after school, early literacy. And that's what we're offering, the La Ferrari Buddy Language School that we're pushing. In our project 2019, it is a mission. It is, it is not only a mission, it's where we are in a movement to push for reading. I want reading scores to go up. So this movement is really, really on the ball when it comes to getting children to read. I left sixth and seventh grade teaching history to go into setting up kindergarten classrooms. I loved it so much. I saw the benefit that I asked to stay there. And then I was given the first grade class that I had from my kindergarten class to travel with me upstairs to my first grade class. I could then prove how smart they were because I already had all of them reading at kindergarten. By the time they went to first grade, I had children that were reading in second and third grade level, one child reading at fourth grade level. The reading specialist couldn't believe it. She had to bring him in to test him. She saw him reading at one of our graduation programs. She thought he was memorizing this information until she tested him. Now, they wanted to know, of course, what materials was I using. The question is, what materials was I not using? I was using a number of different materials, but we taught phonics. We made sure every child understood phonics and how to encode and outcode and how to take dictation at the board, how to transcribe on the typewriter or computer. So these children knew how to manipulate the computer and they learned how to manipulate the keyboard and listen to the sounds of the letters and type them. Let them go to the board so they can display their errors, so we can correct their errors while they're at the board and not later on. And they don't have to erase their errors. 
Let their errors stay on the board so they can then show the improvement. It's a special way of teaching reading, trust me. And it's a lot of work, and you're going to experience this. Some of you are not going to want to look at the curriculum. You want to bypass it and do something else. Don't do it. Stay with the curriculum and follow the curriculum because they're taking you somewhere and getting these children to learn all the rules, all the regulations of the fairy letters, understanding the consonant blend, how do you blend words together, how do you add uh, your sub, how do you add your, your, your two compound words, all of these things. And what I'm saying is that once we present a program for early literacy and we do that for before and after school, Everyone learns to read. And the teacher doesn't have to worry about it because when they come in off the bus, they're reading because we're putting them on a reading program to read. And we are rewarding them for reading books. I once had a program where every child who read a book would get a, a coupon for a pizza. And everybody wanted to go to Pizza Hut. So I had all of my classroom reading uh, in kindergarten, all of them. So when they went on to first grade, they were ex extensive readers because they had read everything in our library, in our classroom. At that point, I knew I wanted to become a reading specialist, but I couldn't break away to go back to school. So finally, at the age of 60, I was able to go back to school and to get an endorsement in English as a new language. At that point, I was smiling all the way because I knew that I could make a difference for children. If I didn't do anything else, I could teach them to read. I can teach any child to read, no matter how far behind they are. They just have to play catch up. But here's the thing at this round table principle. You must work with me. You cannot get with the teachers and side against what we're doing. We're coming in as an extracurriculum organization. You must be properly geared up with us so that we don't spend time fighting with your, with your teachers, because we're not. We're not going to fight with your teachers. As soon as we see the sign of your teachers being quarrelsome, unreliable, and unsupportive, we are out of there. Your school doesn't get the service. I'm sure you don't want to throw away a master teacher skills and other people's support system. I'm sure you don't want your people acting out, so you're going to alert them ahead of time. Do not go in here and negate what they're telling you. We're the experts in this area, and you are in noncompliance because if the state comes in and starts assessing those children in special ed and find out that you inappropriately place children there who are geniuses, who are gifted and talented, you're going to lose a lot of money. And I'm sure you're not up for it. There are a lot of children that have attention deficit disorder that are gifted and talented. And they do not need to be fully placed in a special ed category. They need to be mainstreamed and taken out for a pull-out program. There's too many geniuses that I've seen in special ed, and it breaks my heart to know that you have sentenced them their principal. You have gotten the referrals from the teacher. You say that our job is to identify, to test, and to make referrals, or the other way around. But you wait for us to give you the list of children that need special ed. What would happen one year if you got no list and the teacher says, I'm going to keep them here in my class? It's not a learning disability, but I got to properly teach them how to read. Some teachers have got to take the responsibility upon themselves that they've got to do better at understanding their curriculum. And when they don't, they got to take additional classes to open up those curriculums and not store some off to the side. And the ones that you like with the mimeograph and the diddle, 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 I'm telling you, for you lazy teachers, it's time out for that diddle, diddle stuff. To cringe when I see a diddle sheet, a mimeograph sheet, instead of you breaking that sheet up 
teaching certain vowels, teaching certain consonants, so that you don't overwhelm the child with all of this stuff on the page. Some children can be overwhelmed by print, and you think they're special ed, when in fact, you've over inundated them with too much information that they have to process. Some children have processing problems, at least those children that are in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. They have a problem with tracking. They can't begin to figure out to start at the bottom or the top. You've got to teach penmanship. You've got to teach handwriting so you can teach that child how to track. If that child cannot track, he cannot follow you along the way when you're teaching. He's lost in the shuffle or she's lost in the shuffle. So we've got to teach everything. We cannot assume that the child knows how to track because when they come from home, mothers hasn't did their job of teaching. Used to be a long time ago. These children had excellent penmanship and you didn't have to teach them handwriting. They knew how to write their name. Now the child doesn't know an A from a B and he doesn't know how to write his name and he still can't get a cat. Well, mothers that are at home, I see how you run in and try to set the table and you never ask who has homework or can I help you. Mothers think the schools are supposed to do everything and they believe that the school is supposed to work with that child's morale. That child needs you to be his best advocate. And I'm going to teach you how to be an advocate for your children when you motivate them and tell them they're good and don't just fake it, but when they're really good, tell them they're good and reward them. It's okay to reward children. We're so busy giving out punishment, we don't know how to use rewards to better a child. If you give rewards, the child will look forward to you giving them something and he will want to perform. We got children doing all this great work and staying on the dean's list or the high honor roll, and they get no rewards at home. Children come back to me and say, well, I've been on the honor roll all month. My mommy hasn't even looked at my honor roll certificate. That child soon going to get tired and say, let me start running with the bad group. At least I can get some attention from my bad friends. You don't want it to happen, Mommy. You want to make sure that you are telling that child, if you make the honor roll next month, I'm going to buy you those gym shoes you want. And then when you make the high honor roll, I'm going to take you downtown and let you order a la carte from the restaurant. You've got to give these children something to live for. We used to have Fridays where after you finish all your work, you got all your work in now. We get a chance to go to our store. And with the money that you've been paid when you first come to class, your dollar bills, five of them throughout the week, you get a chance to go shop at your own store, economic style, where you keep the money circulating in your community. And these are real prizes that we have in our store. Mothers, you can go out and buy things the same way and reward your children. But let's get back to the principal. My Mr. Principal or Mrs. Principal, you got to get on the ball because it's your place to make sure that these teachers are not giving you a whole bogus list of children who need special ed. Some of them may need speech therapy and shouldn't even be in special ed. Work with your speech therapy. Work with her. Work with her because she's willing to work with those tie tongue children and untie their tongues so you can put them back in the main classroom. Some teachers want to get rid of their kids because they don't like their personality and they just don't want to be bothered, so they forward them on to special ed. Now, if a, if a teacher gets in an argument with the child and they're not getting along, some teachers want to just get rid of that child in the classroom, period, because he's hard to deal with, so they forward him on to special ed. That cannot be happening, principal. Just because a teacher doesn't like a child or she's not compatible with the child, then have her go and work with her emotional children and find out what they like, what they don't like, what kind of character they are, 
Know something about your children in the classroom. Know what they what they appeal to. Know get their birthdays and find out what they're attracted to. You know something about your children, and if the children know you see them, and you say, "I see you," I know who you are. Guess what? They'll want to perform for you like twenty going north. Everything you want, they want to be providing you with that because they want you to know their name and learn their names the first week of class. Don't go around and call them what's in my jig. You know who I'm talking about, little little Juana, little Juana. You know who you're talking about. Come on over here, Juana. No, you know you learn that child's name. You spend time putting their names on their desk and you properly assign them to that desk and you go down that aisle and that road before they get there and you memorize those names. So when they come up to you, you're not talking to just anybody. You know that child firsthand. That was the first thing that I made up my mind that no child was going to be in my class that I didn't know anything about their personality or who they were. I was going to know those children. And somebody tried to come in and steal one of my best children because they thought I hadn't assessed her and they wanted her in their class because she was a helper bee. I said, no, no, no. I will not be transferring her out to anybody's class. She is my helper bee. I helped to groom her and you've just seen her in the hallway and you've heard about her. Now you want her in your class. No deal. You have to stand up for your children. You have to advocate for your children. You are a team. You are a group. You are a family. And if your children are getting in trouble on the playground, during recess or lunch hour, you go out there to see about them. That's your team. That's your group. And if there's something going on, you call the mama. You take up the next manner. You don't want to get that child suspended when you put them in the hands of the principal and all they know is suspend, suspend, suspend. No. Black boys are suspended too much. They have a statistic showing that mostly special ed black boys are suspended, and they shouldn't be. So you take that child under your wing and you call that mother and you tell that child, you ask the child, what is it? Why did you fight? Who started it? You get the story from them before you call the mother. And then if the child can have an in-school suspension, give them an in-school suspension. But let them know you're not going to bat for them if they're fighting in the hallway every day. But they're not going to get that privilege. But because they're part of your crew, you came to rescue them. Now, I'm telling you what I know. In my 30-some-odd years of being a school teacher, I know children if I don't know anything else. And I know they want to be seen. And they want to be loved by you. If they know you care about them, you're going to come to their house. You're going to see about them. They're going to give you their best. I had five children that was always giving me their best. I set them up front as a role model. I began to go visit the homes. I made sure I visited their homes first. And weren't they happy and surprised that I came to spend time with them in their home? And even on Saturday, to come and get their mother and them and take them out for McDonald's. They were my friends. I could not leave them hanging. And yet most people say, why are you hanging out with your students and parents? Because they were the first line of command. That parent was the one that would go downtown and give a good report for me. If I had to be let go, they would fight for me. But yet we up in the principal's grill, smiling, trying to get in with the principals and the other teachers around there, and they won't do a darn thing for you. But if you invest in your parents, a whole lot could go well for you. Now, Project 2019 wants to do a whole lot of stuff. We want to look at the curriculum called STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. We want to gear these children that are in the after-school program, before and after school, towards the science technology process. We want to give the Liberty children a chance to learn engineering. So we want to expose them to engineering. Nothing but science, technology, engineering. This is IT. This is what's in demand. So when these children go into the high schools and into the elementary school, they're talking high tech. They're already geared up for geeks. Yeah, we want to gear them up for geeks. I know about this. 
because I started the process with my son when he was just elementary. And he said, Mom, I want to be a geek someday. I said, baby, what's that all about? How can I help you? He showed me what a geek was, and we went to the store where the geek would actually drive off in his car and go into the community, and he showed me what geek looked like. And I said, let's get on a path for you to become a geek. He eventually became a geek and was known all over the community for coming in and fixing hardware on computers. Children need to know that they can get a job because they all want a job. They all want you to sign some papers for them to get involved in after-school programs over at the mall so they can work. But let's give them some meaningful jobs, not just jobs that are sales rep, but they can prepare to do coding and understanding the IT of it all. Now, we even have software that helps with the blocks for the little bitty preschoolers. And I say start with preschoolers because they're going to come to you. Come to you as a preschooler because they want to please you. They want to be on top of things. You can have them babies looking so spiffity and ready to do programming that people say, what did you do to them? Now, not only the STEM program, we want to do pre-college programs, getting them ready to go to pre-college camps like Purdue University uh, pre-college camp in engineering. That I know about because I work towards getting young men to go there to sign up. Now, even programs like a mission to Mars, which we work with with older children, they plan all year long for a mission to Mars, and then we got them uniforms so they could take that mission to Mars at Purdue University, and they launched off, and they traveled into space. Wasn't that something for them to plan the whole year and then to see themselves doing the follow through, meaning that they begin to plan and orchestrate and follow through. Now, we not only want just the pre-college program, we want to teach them about how to look for colleges, for how to uh, accentuate on the positive of the colleges that they want to go to, putting their application in, going to visit the colleges and going on these trips. Now, we will have someone speaking on that whole topic who's an expert in that area, and the young children will get to hear and see what it looks like, okay? And then we are looking at bilingual. Why is it necessary to speak two languages? Here's where Nabi comes in at. I've been supporting Nabi, and Nabi wanted me to open up the chapter here in Indiana, but a lot of people are fighting against having English as a second language, having two languages. But I recommend two languages, preferably Kiswahili and Medunetra for our African-American children so that they can speak two languages that will help them with the first language of the Orthodox language. It's very important that you understand about speaking two languages because most engineers have to have two levels of, of, of a foreign language. You have to have science and a foreign language. So we're going to have one of our top keynote engineers talk to you about the benefit of speaking English as a second language, okay, or the benefit of having two languages to speak. Now, we even have a gentleman that is an entrepreneur that will be speaking, and he'll be talking to the general public about the necessity and why it's important for you to get your economic status for trading up, to understand how you can invest in trading. And he'll be talking to us. And this gentleman's father was a mayor of Gary, Indiana. I'm not going to give you any clues. You'll see the itinerary that will be posted. Okay? I will be speaking on the effects that females have on African-American males. And this is part of my... Uh, rendition from my thesis. I will be monopolized, well, I'll be expounding upon it, and Dr. Juwanda Kanjuku was the one that came up with the conspiracy to destroy black boys. I said, who are the conspirators? And he said, why don't you research and find out? And I did, and I have some information to share with you about who the conspirators were and who are they still that are affecting black boys in the education system. So I'll be speaking on that topic as well. Then we have Mrs. Brittany, uh, who will come in as the owner of her own child care, 
and she will talk to you about the bureaucracy and the red tape that she had to go through in order to set up her own child care center in her home. And she's aspiring to get her credentials now in the indirect route of the CDA. And she'll tell you exactly what process you need to take in order to apply for the grants and scholarships to get those credentials. And she'll be speaking with us as well. Now, um, Chuck Sanford, the founder, uh, he'll be telling you where you can get his book at and how you can use his book as a, a, an actual movement to make changes in your family's life. He will explain to you what Project 2019 has done for him over the 20 years and how you can benefit from it. Now, 2019 is a very, I'm very, very um, grateful to be a part of Project 2019. Um, the people that are involved in Project 2019, they have high hopes for our African-American people, and they set their, their sights high, which is good. And uh, I do not want to see them evaporate, but I, I want to see them to increase with younger people becoming the facilitator. So if you're interested in becoming a facilitator in your state and you would like to be a part of Project 2019, let us know. You can contact us at O-M-I-Y-I-N-K-A, number one, at yahoo.com. And you can contact me and say I'm interested in heading up my own facility in my area as a Project 2019 movement. And then we will tell you that we're requiring you to have a before and after school program. And with that before and after school program, you must uh, focus in on the STEMS program, which is what I told you, and also working with the whole family and becoming an advocate for special needs families. Because this is who doesn't get the help, is our special needs family. So we want to teach the special needs family that up under um, – 457, Section 8, they can become a trained advocate, and they can go out and do a surrogate advocate for other parents, and the government will assist them if they prevail in these cases. They will assist them in accommodating them for their time and effort. We're pushing these parent information centers because most black people are not applying to get these grants, and they should be. And uh, we're also pushing you to purchase your own set of training materials for a parent information center. Uh, myself and several other people put together this three-part training that will help you to get on your way with understanding uh, co-parenting resolution, understanding how to do parent information center. And I've said a whole lot, and I want to go to the phone lines now. At 319-527-6060. You may call in now. We are ready to speak to you about this project. And we're going to go to a commercial.
ladies and gentlemen, and we're back, and we're going to go to commercial again, and we hope that you'll call in soon. All right. Now, we'd like to say those who are sitting on the fence out there who have not made their mind up whether or not they'll be attending this conference, we're asking you to come on out to our conference. We have lots of things that we're going to be doing. We're going to be working with Zoom, first of all. And Zoom will accommodate you if you are one of our speakers and would like to be highlighted on our screen. It will give you the itinerary, which will be listed there as the time. We're starting our program off at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, because we have a full day. And Chuck Sanford will be coming on first uh, after the welcoming speech at 9. So come on at 930 uh, I'll give the welcoming speech, welcoming you to our I, to to our conference and to be a part of what we're doing. If you still want to volunteer, you want to do some things behind the scenes, please let me know. Now, let me tell you about the two people we're featuring. And this half the show, I want to focus in on how we mentor and help other people. Two young men came to me that was in my messenger group and said they wanted to go back to school, and that they believed they had talent, and they wanted to to establish some papers, and they wanted to know if I could help them to enroll in school so that they can go back and apply for scholarship. Now, being that they were in another country, and it was a little difficult to know all the schools in another country like Jamaica, I didn't even proceed to pretend that I knew about their procedures and process in their country. So what I suggested to them was mainly if you get a degree that's in demand and you get an international degree, then I can help you with that because then you can use that credential internationally, whether it be in the United States or over in Jamaica. So I suggested since they had so much to offer their community and villages that they might want to look at an international educational license, which will serve them well and allow them to have a license, because I am I am I am prone on anybody having some type of license to say that they can do what it is they want to do. That license will take them far. Now, if you're an entertainer and you're singing, you don't need a license to say that you can sing. That becomes a hobby, and you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You might want to do some things solo in the evening with your singing and performing, and There are many people that sing and perform, so you're up against a lot of competition. Now, also, if you're an artist and you draw and your pictures are not getting enough visibility uh, and you think you're very good, sometimes it may take a while before anybody notices your work. But if you put all your work together and make it a conglomerate, people will have more of a chance of seeing it. So I then recommend it to the other gentleman who wants to become a culinary artist and he wants to display his work and cooking. Yes, there's a lot of culinary artist programs out there, but whether or not people get jobs, I don't know what the statistics is. But what I do know and what I can help them with is to become an educator because that's what I do. I help individuals become an educator and get their license and credentials in child development. Now, These two young men, because they were international in Jamaica, I thought that they would do better to help their villages to establish schools. And maybe we can work on sponsoring their schools to get set up. And they can get their credential in Montessori teaching internationally. And they can do that through correspondence, through the mail, and they can do that online. That way I can help them to apply for the scholarship and to do a GoFundMe, which is what I set up for one of the gentlemen, a GoFundMe, so that people can fund them. And we can help them to get their uh, GoFundMe uh, program set up, and they can get the training, and they can finish the program in less than one year where they become endorsed as a Montessori international teacher. With those credentials, they can go set up their own child, they can set up their own school, or they can hire teachers who need employment, and they can help the village 
because they can now then provide child care for or elementary school for those children. Montessori is a lot different than a child care center. You can actually make it into a, a, a preschool learning center so it becomes a school and you can add grades on each year. So I recommended this to one of our constituents is Dickerson Salmon. I also recommended it to Omar Salmon. So these are the two young men that we are going to be helping. And Dickerson is an entertainer and an artist. So you'll be seeing some of his artwork on display and uh, whether or not we can get him to come up front to perform. We haven't confirmed that yet. But Dickerson's food will be displayed throughout our Zoom. So you can see the kind of food he makes. Now, I told them, with their dreams and desires, they could take this into the school with them. They can prepare their own lunches and still get their work seen. And Dickerson can go as the head teacher and exemplify on the artistry. But at the same time, he'll be getting a credential in teaching a license that he can use and create work for his other peers in the community as well as help parents to educate their children. Now, a young man over in Jamaica may not be able to finish high school. Sometimes he may not be able to finish, be able to enter college. But we've got to start with the basics first. And we're talking about getting a diploma, which carries a lot of weight. Now, I hope that Omar and Dickerson will listen to this viewing. As a matter of fact, we're going to make sure they get a chance to hear it. We are featuring you, and we have put your name on our itinerary, and you are going to be asked to speak to us about your desires to go to school and get credentials and papers. And we have you on the program, Omar, as well as Dickerson. And we'd like for you to contact us at your earliest convenience. I know it's hard for you to get on the phone, being at an international call, but we would love to have you come and be a part of our platform so we can play you up and get more people to donate to your cause. And Chuck Sanford is well aware of the fact that we're featuring these young men, and we want to give them some opportunities to get into the education field. This I know as much as I can help them with. I didn't want to do the CDA because sometimes that is not setting them up for school. With the Montessori, we can help to set them up and get them ready to own their own school after they finish their training, which is less than a year. So I want you to applaud them. And we want you to give us a phone call. And if you have any input that you can give us, call us at 319 527 6060. I am the host here. I am Omi Inca 7. We've been on the air for over 10 years now. We've done quite a bit of work on these airways. We've interviewed just about anybody who's somebody. And we would like to interview Dickerson and Omar as our two candidates that we are going to assist and help with the GoFundMe for their education. And once again, we're going to ask you to get on those phone lines and to call in because we'd like to hear from you soon. And let's go to...
much for joining us on this occasion. We are Oracle Divination Network, and our whole work is founded upon looking at our various different spirituality, as well as looking at those priests and priestesses out there. What are you doing, and what have you been doing in the community? We do solicit for your uh, request to come in to be a part of our staffing. We are looking to put your names on a list so that we will have a listing of those spiritual people in the community that are doing spiritual work. We want to register you as one of our favorites. We want you to be able to solicit for other people to utilize your skills. There's a lot of people that are stressed out with anxiety that do need to have those particular priests and priestesses to work with them on a one-on-one basis or in a family setting. Now, we would like to uh, orchestrate you so that you can work with the whole family. We are a, a, a parent information center, and we deal with family issues. So we definitely want to serve this up family style so that we can solicit your assistance out there in the community. Right now, when this whole thing is over with, with the coronavirus, our services are going to be needed very badly in the area of counseling couples and marriage couples, as well as families who are single heads of household. And we're going to need those um, priests and priestesses to go out and to sit with these families and to um, do oracle teachings and divining to show them what options they have, which are alternative, which are not all uh, dealing with um, the actual drug pharmaceuticals, because a lot of people are going to be on drugs and trying to maintain themselves on sedatives. A lot of people are going to be stressed out and who are going to need prescriptions because they can't handle it. Well, you don't have to revert to getting prescriptions. You can go at home and have your counselor come to your home to work directly with you on uh, non-drug products and trying to show you how to maintain your body because a lot of us are becoming so resistant to medicine that they now have to try alternative things. And there's a lot of nutritional specialists out there who are priests and priestess. And they know the herbs and they understand how you are to take these herbs in order to keep your body stable. Now, they've already told us those people who have a low uh, immune deficiency and whose free radicals are overtaking their body, then they're more susceptible to this virus, I understand. So a number of us, we're going to develop our gardens, and we're going to want to get into our natural food substance. And we know that natural foods can be very expensive sometimes, but we can show you that there are priests and priestesses out there that can get you on a program and help you for a little bit of nothing. But it's very important that we get a hold of those priests and priestesses and that they contact us and get on our registry. We, we do want to be of service and offer the community lists of priestesses who've had experience, who've had clientele, and who would now like to work in their prospective areas and who would like their names put on a roster along with their years of service and the type of specialties they have. Um, Most of you know that I worked in the hospital as a healer for many, many years. Uh, I was taken off the respiratory therapy ward and then uh, was directed to go to the cancer ward to work with cancer patients and to work with the chaplain. I was fortunate that they saw that I had other skills that would be beneficial to those dying cancer patients. So I worked with the cancer patients that had all kinds of cancer, oak cancer, throat cancer, uh, diagram cancer, pancreatic cancer, and I merely just prayed for them and sent positive energy to them. And that was acceptable uh, to the chaplain. He wanted me to be a part of his uh, support system. And so I was noted as being a healer, an energy healer 
right there at Compley Hospital in Aurora, in Illinois. So um, I have not been doing a lot of work uh, in practicing. I'm sort of like on retirement, and uh, I do readings only for my family members. But I do know what it takes to heal is uh, readings, and we have got to stay in touch with our practices and our rituals. So some of you who are not getting involved in your rituals and practices, we're going to have an hour of prayer at the end of our program uh, for um, April 25th. We're going to show you how to pour libation, how to summon the spirits, and how to contact the ancestors so that they can continue to do the work that we need to have done in our community. we got a lot of work that has to be done in our community. And some of us are not relying on our spiritual walk with God. Some of us are perishing and falling along the wayside. Some of us are so weary that we are picking up bottles of alcohol, drinking it, and using it as a sedative. Well, I'm saying put down that bottle because the Bible says don't rise early to give strong drink to your neighbor. And you don't take strong drink unless you're ready to perish. So you've got to leave this alcohol and sedatives alone so you can preserve yourself and your body. But we have a serious problem. We don't know who to believe anymore. Then believe in believe on yourself. If you cannot believe in these people that are uh, gracing the television and airway, then believe in the spirit of God who lives within inside of you. But it's very vital that you should come to this Project 2019. We're a spiritual group of people, and we this is not our first walk in the park. And I'm sure you're going to want to connect yourself with us based on the things we're going to be doing throughout the year. So this is a great opportunity to line up with your family and hook up with the family. Because I'm sure with some of the middle-aged people like, like Chuck and Rose, myself and my husband, we have a lot that we can transition to you and a lot that we can help you with. So for you young millennials, do latch on to some seniors. We have a lot of legacy that we want to leave behind, a lot of information that we want to leave behind so that you can become priests and priestesses. How many of you out there would like to get in a priestess and a priest class to learn some of the basic things, to learn how to divine? And I will be giving a class on divining and understanding how and why you divine and how you don't use this for people who are trying to get answers on their love life or their relationship. This is supposed to be reserved for critical time. E-kings are not supposed to be taken out of the corner except for during critical times. A lot of people are flipping these cards and they're giving readings all the time and they got the spirits out around them all the time. You have to be very careful with those cards being protected because they pick up the spirits in the atmosphere. We can send Reiki healing. We can send energy right now. And I want to send some energy across the airway to any of those people who might be sick with palsy, who might need to get up out of bed and carry their own bed, who might need to begin to uh, calm down the spirits, to mount them, to heal them who might need to have an understanding for how this African theological works. It's not a religion. It's a way of life. And I'm not telling you to get involved in another religion when I worked so hard to get out of these man-made religions. And I picked up the way of life that Yoruba had, and I practiced that in my life. I do not want to be associated or connected to a religion because I know religion binds, and it is a form of of imprisonment, just like you are putting people back in prison, and we need our freedom now. And now that we got our freedom, we need a way of life. How are we going to live our life? What are we going to do? There's a lot of young people out there that don't know what to do from day to day. They don't know what are, what are priorities in their life. You cannot just make material things your priority. You cannot just buy everything and think that that's going to bring you happiness. You got to extend yourself out to others and make sure that those who don't have, that you make it possible to impart knowledge and things to them. We can only get so many things in our life, and we can never be happy sometimes because 
we are getting into greed, and the more we get, the more we want. We've got to start looking at our brothers and sisters and making sure that we are preserving ourselves for a community. And understanding communal living is that we must communicate. We cannot desegregate or we cannot disconnect. And this instruction that we're giving about disconnecting is not one for an African holistic lifestyle. That's why I came on these airways and I come on here as frequently as I do because I know we must have contact. We are communal people and we will stay alive and we will get through this coronavirus. We will choke it down to the ground and become, make it become finite and it will have no place in our life. And every day you got to say down with the coronavirus and we are going to have to spit on the coronavirus concept and that we cannot live in our lives and it cannot grow up in our home. So as for me and my family, we shall serve the Lord. Corona, coronavirus cannot, cannot stay in the same presence with the Lord. And we know we are God. So we are not going to allow the corona, coronavirus to grow up in our life. We will fight it until no end. We're at war, people, whether you like it or not. And we're trying to get you ready to get in your positions because you're at war. Some of you will faint and some of you won't make it, but you have to decide ye this day who you will serve. And if you are serving the God that lives within you, then you have the strength to surpass all of this. And this too will pass in a little while. We won't always have this problem with us. Stay tuned for commercial. We'll be right back at you. Sherelle calling you. How are you? All right. All right. But, uh, yeah, taking, uh, here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't know. Hello? So, how have you been doing? I heard you were sick for a while. Uh, yes. And, yes, yes. Uh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Okay. Hello? All right. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, we have hold Steve it. Bart hold Elliott it. on the line here. Uh, and Bart hold Elliott and I were commissioners uh, at um, in engineering together, and he was one of the most famous hold engineers hold that I was a scheduler planner for. 
and we're getting him on the line here because we want to tell him about this Project 2019. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is your OMI, and we are talking about the plans that we have for our event, our conference for Project 2019, which is going to be on April the 25th at 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening. All right. All right. All right. I'm sorry. Hello? All right. Hello, Hi. Mark. I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah. Hey, Zinni. Um, hey, Zinni. Okay. Zinni, okay. Zinni? Yes. Hey, sis. <laughs> Hello? Yes, I'm here. I was just letting you finish talking there. Oh. Yeah, I wanted to tell you that we were doing a conference online, and I talked to Sam, and uh, I told him about the conference, and I asked him if he had your number so I could personally call you. You know, we're in Indianapolis now. We're not in uh, Maryville anymore. Okay. Yeah, so so we, um, um, Project 2019, do you remember Project 2019? Did I ever tell you about Project 2019? No. Okay, it's a movement. And it works on uh, programs like the Foreign After School programs and a movement to get more African Americans enrolled in uh, higher level learning programs such as uh, associate degree programs and bachelor programs. And we actually help those people to get enrolled in school and we mentor them. And uh, we're having our conference online. It's like a virtuous conference and we're having speakers and we will be actually presenting and working with uh, schools to get their program lined up with Project 2019 so we can help them in developing their before and after school program. Okay. Yeah. So how is Phyllis doing? I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. Can you send out? Can you send out? How you doing? Okay. I have been thinking about you guys so much. And oh. when we moved to Indianapolis, I, I kind of like lost my phone book had to uh, find Sam. He wasn't listed anymore. And eventually we had to sit out the RFP to get Sam so we could find out your number. Well, thank you. Thank you. But what I'd like for you to do, why don't you, what time is the uh, phone conference? Uh, it's going to be on April 25th from 9 into 9. It's an open conference. You can come at any of those times. We have speakers and breakout rooms, and we will be discussing our plans for uh, 2019. We had that uh, 400 year that we was out of slavery, and we were supposed to write projections of what we were going to do for actually being able to take over now that we are out of slavery. And um, so we actually, our goal is to try to get into as many schools as we can and reintroduce how to get the black boy out of special ed. So that's one of the topics we'll be talking about. Okay. And now, when the number that came across is a New York number, is that the number we can reach you on? Yes, that's the number you can reach us at. That's my, um, that's my, actually, no, that number is my uh, uh, blog talk number. Let me give you my number. Oh, okay. I'm getting, give me two seconds here. We'll write it down. Okay. okay. I'm ready. Okay, that number is 317-707-7809. Okay. That's my, and um, my home line number. Okay, I got 317-707-7809? Correct, uh-huh. Okay, and you said the conference is on April 25th. April 25th from 9 to 9. And we're putting the itinerary up today, and it will show you all the speakers we have, um, the keynote speakers, the breakout rooms, and we're just going to be basically getting into all the things that we're doing in the community, and we're going to also come up with some objectives of some of the things that we can apply for grants. Um, this is a non-for-profit organization where um, we didn't do a lot with applying for grants before 
before I came on board, but now I'm suggesting that we apply for some grants. And that's why I called you guys because I wanted to have you guys head up some grants. And we also need facilitators in your area to head up chapters where they can actually get a salary, a monthly salary or a weekly, whatever they come up with. But we're getting some funds that will be coming in for this non for profit status. And I thought that you and Bart would be a great uh, asset because we're looking at um, doing our pre college program and we're working at the STEMS program science, technology, engineering, and math. And my son, he's an engineer, so he's heading up one of the programs. And we wanted more people that had the background in technology to come in so they can head up these. Um, uh, STEMS program to get the children involved in the before and after school program. Well, it sounds very interesting. Now, just let me explain, and I, I am very interested. Bart, um, you know, he had a couple of strokes. Okay. And, and the last okay. one, unfortunately, the last one has affected his speech ability mentally. He's aware and, you know, just smart and all that. But, um, there's a disconnect between what's in his head and what comes out of his mouth. And he's getting better. I tell everybody every day I see more words coming back. I I like to think by next year this time he will be more verbal he will be more verbal. But mm-hmm. um yes, we still are interested. Okay, okay. Well that means so that he needs a lot of therapy. And a lot of coaching and encouragement. I I didn't know what the state was because Sam didn't give me all the details, but I knew it was something, and that's why I was working so feverishly to get you guys on the phone because I said, well, I don't want to forget about my good friends because when we left Indianapolis, a lot of people were looking for us, and we came here. We thought we were buying a house. We put money down. <laughs> was ready to move in, and then. Um, something went wrong where they didn't want my husband on the mortgage or whatever. And then we ended up sort of getting displaced because we didn't want to go back to Miraville. So we ended up staying in a hotel waiting for this house for uh, almost six months. And wow. so, it, it, you know, everything was in storage. And, you know, when you have stuff in storage, you're just not settled yet. And uh, about two years ago, we finally got settled in the duplex. And uh, we kind of said, well, now is a good time to pull out our phone books. And so when I got ready to find my phone book, it wasn't in storage. I had to recreate it. So I apologize for not having that, gotten in contact with you guys because, you know, I would have came over and did whatever I could for Bart. And, I appreciate uh, that. You know, I definitely would have came over to see about him. Well, again, he's doing, um, I mean, much better. Uh we were in therapy, and I was sure I was setting up another therapy, and then this whole crazy pandemic thing started. So at this point, I am very nervous about him going out with good reason. So I am just waiting for this, you know, this pandemic to clear a little bit, and he will be going back to a therapy, even hopefully we can even do an online one, which I'm going to call them tomorrow and see what's available there. But again, mm-hmm. like I said, um, I'm constantly getting more words. At first, I was a little nervous because, you know, no one could tell me whether he would get his speech back. Mm-hmm. But I, the the brain is interesting, and it rewires itself. And so, I mean, like he can say things that he couldn't say anymore. He can call me in his room and tell me to sit down. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's... Okay. There's constantly new words. Uh, it's just now I'm, what I'm seeing recently is a combo mm-hmm. of words. Before it was always just one word. Now, and you know, Phyllis, uh, sometimes friends think, oh, I better stay away because he's in therapy. That's the wrong time to stay away because familiarity breeds uh, the ability to come back. Uh, I work in, in the hospital with a lot of patients that had all kinds of stuff wrong with them. And believe you me, the more he knows that that friends are there, the more that it's going to challenge him to try to keep up with his friends and conversation. Because as I called him, I noticed he he was saying things. He said, but wait a minute, wait a minute. He was saying, well, at the worst, I I knew something was impeding his speech, you know. But all that stuff, with time, uh, it can change. Because my, my sister had a stroke, and they didn't know why. And they kept doing the research, trying to figure out why she had the stroke. And I was wondering, why was it so important for them to know that? They said so they can rewire her brain. So 
so that it doesn't happen again. So it never did happen again. And she's gone stroke free now for almost 15 years and she's functioning and everything. But it was a close call there for a while um, because my sister, my other sister had a stroke too. And I was like, oh my God. And they were telling me that if you don't get on this hot, this, this uh, sugar diabetes, that you're going to have a stroke. And I just started changing my diet completely, just changing it. And I said, no stroke is going to come near me because I am going to change this diet. And I did. And I never had to take the, high, the sugar diabetes medicine or the shots. So I, I'm like a walking miracle, they claim. They don't know how I'm still living without having this stroke that they claim I was going to go into. And it never happened. But the brain is very interesting, you know, um, with all the stuff that he knew. He can rearrange his brain and his thinking. He might not be up to part like he used to be, but he can communicate and be a part of life. And I'll be I friends agree. with what happens. Because that I is agree. His, we went through a lot of stuff together. Well, his first stroke was due to high blood pressure. And the thing is, yes, he knew he had it. He thought he could manage it, and it just he just couldn't. And so now, you know, he doesn't like being on high blood pressure medicine, but it's like this or, you know, just just he has to, like I told him. Right now, unless he has a total overhaul, I mean, I'm just talking about just going on a straight raw diet, which he's not up for, um, he will have this high blood pressure. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't take a lot of medications. He keeps, he takes the minimal. But still, um, because of um, b- black people being more vulnerable to this virus, and the thing is that what I read is that a lot of black people are more vulnerable because of high blood pressure and diabetes, and That's some right. of it is some of it is what some of the medications they're even on. Um, That's right. And um, so he's on a he's not on the one. There's a particular medication that bonds with this virus. And um, he's not on that one, thank God. But I just oh my um, God! So you mean to tell me there is one that bonds with the uh, if you coronavirus? Up, if you look up, they say that the coronavirus. I've been looking on the internet, and they say that it bonds to an ACE. Is that a protein? I'm not sure, but it's something. It bonds to when it comes into the body. I was looking at a video. It has something to do with this ACE. And what mm-hmm. happens is that some of the medications... Now the ACE is to do with the blood sugar because that's a count they look at. Um, oh. If it ain't over seven, then the ACE, blood sugar, well, uh, has to be lowered. Well, you have to look under uh, this, but some, um, some of the blood pressure medicines are AC inhibitors. Mm-hmm. And... So, unfortunately, is he, any, is he on any beta blockers? Well, they see he. I think those are the beta blockers, and those are the ones that kind of um, that the the virus is, I think, bonding to. And so, mm-hmm. what happens is he's not. See, he's not on a beta blocker. Thank okay. God for that. But he's on a calcium. He's on a calcium blocker, I think. And they said there was no issue with that one. But for some of these beta blockers that that or inhibitors that have this ACE in it, it's somehow mm-hmm. it's 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 not good with the virus. Okay, and uh, I think well, what let me, I'm let me also tell you something else, Phyllis. That what I know, um, I don't know if you remember my brother Jimmy. I'm going to contact Jimmy and have him oh, call you. Of course I do, and I and he knows the. He knows about what what happened with Bud. It's just that it's, okay. it's it's so hard to sometimes get in contact with him. Oh yeah, he's got he had ended up getting a private number because he was getting so many calls. But I am going to call him and tell him he needs to contact Bud as soon as he can. But one thing I did learn from working with with, with Jimmy and the Brain, we we discovered that the very thing that was causing the high blood pressure where they were saying um, no fat and there were these two fats, one with the um, LC, L, LS, L, and LGH and one with the LCL or something. And one of those fats was the strand of fat that the body needed 
and it was becoming deficient in because they were giving it so much of the one strand fat. But you needed that the two strand fat because the two strand fat was this new uh, uh, sugar diabetes, the third stage of sugar diabetes, which is Alzheimer's condition, which causes the stroke because you don't have enough fat in the brain. So we researched this and found out the two strand fat, like olive oil, uh, grapeseed oil, those are the oils that just replace that to alleviate this third stage of Alzheimer's, which was prone people to strokes because they didn't have enough fat in the brain. So I started including the fat in my diet because my, my ACE was very high and they said it was over 10 that I was going to be stroking out. I immediately start substituting grapeseed oil, uh, uh, also the olive oil, large amounts of it. And as I uh, took large amounts of it, I noticed that the tremors and all the stuff that they said was going to bring on the strokes, the cramping of the legs, it went away. And Jimmy and I were looking at that, and we noted that when you have when you have the high blood sugar, the high blood sugar tends to cause you to not have enough fat in the body and you keep they keep telling you don't take fats get rid of the the, uh, the the fats and get rid of all of the cholesterol but that was a long thing to do we needed to do well for the brain because the brain is made up of nothing but fat okay now if we do do the olive oil um i have black seed oil that we don't do enough of um but i you know, I told them, to, well, this is me, really, the black seed oil. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, other than than this, his blood pressure now is in control. Unfortunately, he still has to stay because, you know, he's tr- tried many times to come off the medication. But every mm-hmm. time he tries that, his blood pressure skyrockets, and it just scares me. So i just but you gotta gradually anything you taking them off of you gotta gradually do it. Not okay, well no 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 I'm not even right now trying to take them off of mm-hmm. that because like I said I can't risk his blood pressure going up that high and and right. him having the second stroke I really don't know what caused it he had a different kind of stroke the first stroke was high blood pressure and it was a bleed and we knew it because he we got there his, his blood pressure was off the chart. They knew it was a stroke. I knew it was a stroke. Everybody knew it. The mm-hmm. second time he was taking his medication, I think, because he was talking then, and the only thing it was doing was it had put weakness on his right side, and he was getting the use of his right hand back and doing well, going to therapy on the bus by himself, whatever. And that's why I was so blindsided by the second one because the second one was an actual blockage. And it, to me, it just came from nowhere, and that we they still can't tell me because they put him on a heart monitor for a month, and they mm-hmm. said, well, maybe something was from his heart. But they, after the monitor for a month, they said his heart was good. So mm-hmm. I still don't know what was the cause of the second one, but I just I just don't want a third one. So I just mm-hmm. they like his, like like we told like his cousin and my brother told him. He's on a very low dose of high blood pressure medicine, not a lot. He only takes one high blood pressure medicine in low dose. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to, you know, accept that and just let him, because like now, I said. Is he, he, taking, is he taking any potassium and is he taking any water um, water pills? No, he doesn't do water pills. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's the one he takes is a calcium blocker, and then he does take a statin because, um, so the statin again has to do with the cholesterol, mm-hmm. and outside of that, I make sure he stays on an aspirin, and that's literally what he—that's all he takes. But yeah. uh, through through and the and yeah, they the aspirin that they give to determine if you are candidate to take the aspirin. You know, because they just re- recently were saying that 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 aspirin could do harm, but you have to make sure you use a candidate for it so that you can keep that blood thinned out. And that's what that oil will do. That oil will thin that blood out so it won't become um, coagulative and become thickened. Okay. So even if you gave him 
I don't know if he can have eggs, but if he was taking eggs with also the bacon and the fat, with him that fat that he needed so that it would actually help his body to develop enough fat in the brain. Now, he does eat eggs. He does not eat bacon because we don't eat any pork. Actually, mm-hmm. we eat very little beef or chicken. Uh, we do more. What about turkey? Do you eat turkey at all? Turkey, no. What happens oh. is, I'm sorry, since I since I am home and preparing the meals, I don't eat any poultry or any pork or beef. So pretty oh, much okay. all I do is just do the seafood and the vegetables. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm going to definitely call Jimmy and ask Jimmy to give him a call because I, I think that there's some things that Jimmy could recommend for him because he's been putting packages together for us and well, we've been very pleased with them. But, well, tell uh, him to I'm, call. I'm sorry. This... Go ahead. What? I'm here on uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. If he If he calls, tell him this call in those three days. Okay. Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. I will definitely tell him Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Yeah. Okay. Well, give give um, Byra a hug for me. I am sorry to hear this uh, state, but he can conquer it. He can get over it. And uh, I will definitely keep him in my prayers. And um, please do call me back um, when you get some time and we can talk more about the project and you can tell me what area you'd like to be a part of because it's this group has been around for 20 years. It's real stable, and I think you can do quite a bit with um, your – are you still in High Park or are you in another location? Oh, no, we're still, we're still at the same location. Um, okay. uh, he's not working. I work, but I, I work Tuesday through Friday only. Okay. And, and, you know, I don't work evening, so Tuesday through okay. Friday. And um, – and this my job is two blocks this down the street. Something good for you um, to be a part of because it's right there in Chicago. Chuck and his wife is a family-oriented group, and they're looking for a chapter facilitator right there in Chicago. And you might be able to work directly with them in finding out what they want to do, and then writing grants and doing it up under him. He's an engineer, and his wife and him asked me to do the conference this year. Because uh, I had a school over in Mirabel, and we were connected to an affiliate school, and we ran classes um, online. So that was going real well. And when we decided to relocate uh, to Indianapolis, um, literally he lost a lot of help. <laughs> and then I'm starting back up now as the national executive. So there's a lot of things you can do if you're interested. Oh, I, I, I am very interested. So first of all, I just want to say thank you. So much for calling us and thinking about us. I really appreciate that. Oh no, you guys are my friend. You are family, and it's important. He was just on my mind today, and I had to stop what I was doing to reach him because I was worried about him. And I, I will continue to keep him in our prayers that he will overcome this thing. Thank you. All right. Okay, Phyllis. Then hug. Uh, bar for me. I'm going to let you off the phone now. So you take care, okay? Okay, you Love too. Love you guys. Love Bye-bye. you too. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as we sometimes uh, make different turns in our lives, we leave certain friends behind. But this organization is about friends and connecting to friends and being a part of friends' lives. And even when they're down on their luck, we don't kick our friends, when they're down, we go and see about them and try to lift them up in their spirit. And uh, this gentleman that I was just speaking to was a great, great friend, him and his uh, wife as well. And we worked together side by side in the engineering department developing the B-1 bomber uh, there at Northrop um, uh, Defense Group. And I prepared uh, programs for the engineering department as a scheduled planner. And we also was fortunate enough that we got called upon to do a ministry. We did an actual ministry at noontime. We were two different faiths. I was Christian and he was Muslim. Nevertheless, we brought the word of God to our general population during lunchtime. And people would actually come in to hear us speak. That's where we got our first start in speaking 
uh, and to spiritual groups. And then we advance into working online, doing our workshops and group. So we have a lot of history together. And uh, we went to school together at Purdue University. He's my husband's fraternity brother. So we had a lot of history together. And when he got sick, I didn't know it. And someone made sure that they told me that he was sick and gave me their number because they knew I would be concerned about him and his wife both. And uh, we are praying for them. They're in our prayers. And we hope that he will gain his strength and the blood pressure will cease from rising. So I thank you so much today um, in listening to the sound of my voice. I hope you will come to our conference and we'll be talking again on this airwave about our conference and what we hope to do. One of the things, we will have a corporate prayer. So if you don't do anything else, come out for our corporate prayer. We're going to be sending out frequency and energy healing to raise the level of the sick and to have them to stand up and carry their bed and get better. Because we have to command. We have the authority to command. We have the ability to command because we are the gods and we must stand up and use our ability to command. There's a lot of sick among us. And some of them cannot control their blood pressure. Some of them cannot prevent themselves from getting a stroke. But we're asking God Almighty to allow us to begin to start the corporate prayers of sending out the energy to Bart Elliott to lift him from that bed and that state to help him as he gets stronger. Hold tight. so I can get in here. Okay, let me see. Oh, okay. That's probably what I have to do. Hold on for a minute. Let me see. I'm going up here now. <laughs> 